Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. I know I promised a Wonder Woman video, and that's actually uh, still in development. I've developed that into a three-part series, which is uh, coming soon, coming within this next week. It's going to start at looking at what it means that Wonder Woman is an Amazon. What does that uh, have to do? Why is she an Amazon? What is that? Uh, how, why was that chosen? The second part will be looking at the effect that Marston's Jungian psychology had on the character. And then the third part will be looking at her history and seeing how all of these elements have uh, culminated to, to create a character who's been so misunderstood at different points throughout her history. So that's still on the way. Today though I wanted to give you a quick reaction to Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. It was utterly amazing. Now this is going to be more of a loose reaction, it's not a scripted analysis, but the shtick of my channel is that you do get more analysis and less, you know, just kind of reviews and fanboy um, ravings and rantings and stuff like that. So. It uh, was a great movie, well written from the script up completely. Uh, all the parts were in place and they needed to be there. I think it was a great sequel as well though because it did what sequels are supposed to do. And a sequel is supposed to take the themes of the first film and ramp them up. It's supposed to build on things including the character developments and the character progressions. You're not supposed to ignore things that happened in the first film unless it's like a Bond film and that's not technically a sequel, it's just more of a continuation kind of thing, you know, where you forget the love interest from the first movie because you bring in new elements in the second and stuff like that. That's not what this was. So it built on the elements of the first film nicely. Now I think Guardians of the Galaxy 1 and 2 here really cry out for a psychoanalytic reading. And I'm not the first person who's done this, but uh, seeing the sequel really just another piece really fit well into place, nicely into place for this. So what is a psychoanalytic reading for people or viewers who might not know? Well. Remember, we might have heard of Freud or the Oedipal Complex and um, little boys just want to kill their fathers and marry their mothers and all this kind of um, stuff that it's usually kind of mocked to the when it's described in the extreme of that nature. Psychoanalysis, Freudian, um, Jungian psychoanalysis, isn't really still a thing in the strictest term or strictest sense of, of what they how they practiced it, but it's still the foundation of a lot of good psychology. And it's become a huge theory in its own right of looking at literature and films. Because literature and films are human stories, and this is psychology, so this is a lot of the basis for our own human experience, our own individual stories, however they play out in our own lives. So the idea here is that uh, we see this played out in the first film, so I'm just giving you the very much the, the nickel tour of Freudian um, psychology here. But the idea that, that Peter, the first time we saw him in that first film, was waiting outside his mother's hospital room. She was about to die. He couldn't accept that his mother was dying. Even when she tried to reach for him, he, he shrunk away. He loved his mother. You know, you watch it and you realize, even into this next movie, how much he loved his mother dearly, but he didn't want anything to do with dying mother. Just in his childhood psychology, that, that made sense. Um, he didn't, he shrunk away from dying mother. He didn't want to take her hand because that's dying mother. And he was still clinging desperately to the nurturing, life-giving mother. He didn't get that. That was taken away from him. We only see two father figures in the film, the, his grandpa in the beginning, which was who was kind of a jerk, really, and then Yondu, who um, certainly didn't treat him well, that was kind of a proxy father figure that, that left him quite scarred as well. We then jump immediately to Peter Quill as an adult, and we see how he treats women in his life, right? Women are expendable, he doesn't want to forge any actual attachment to them, so they're just one night stands, and he you know, goes off on this famous uh, roster of different alien races that he slept with and different things like that. He can't make an attachment because he never fully processed the loss of his own mother. He uh, doesn't want to form attachments that might be taken away or might be misunderstood or might be, he doesn't want to get that hurt again that he had when his, his mother died. All this until he meets Gamora and we see actual semblance of feelings developing in him for Gamora. In fact, he eventually sacrifices himself. If you remember when they're both in space, he takes off his helmet and hands it to her in space so that she can survive. Now, Gamora is a, a green character, right? Her alien race is green, and that uh, comes from the comics, of course, but the green also symbolizes nurturing and life-giving, and, and these are the things that he wanted in that mother-type figure. Now, you have to stay metaphorical here. I'm not talking about he's not looking at Gamora as a mother figure. He doesn't want her to be his mommy or anything like that. But he, he's looking for that female figure in his life. The, the idea of Freudian psychology is that as you grow and as you're as your view of your of your parents develop, your mother and father, they eventually mature into the fact that, or to the way that you will go out and seek what you wanted in the mother from an actual mate that you can actually be with in the world. So that that's the general idea, anyway. Um, so we see this happening. Peter develops feelings for Gamora, and then in the and if all this is you know if you're scratching your head and raising your eyebrow at all of this, it's it's proven in the last moment. If you go back and watch the end 
finale of the uh, climax of Guardians of the Galaxy Part 1, when he's got the, the Infinity Stone and Gamora cries out to him, take my hand, he, he, does, he looks at her, but he doesn't see her. He sees his dead mother in the hospital bed again. So this is all coming full circle for him. And that whole film was really about him coming to terms with the mother figure in himself. And, and then with, since he came to terms with that, he was able to actually grow up and actually uh, form adult attachments and adult relationships with other people, other women especially. And we see this, uh, his relationship with Gamora develop and carry over into part two here. So that's, that's part two, uh, one. Now part two... The reason it fits so nicely is because it really dwells on the father figure and the father relationship for Peter. And I'm not going to spoil anything, but I'm you know, I'm not going to spoil anything that's not already known for basic advertising. You can't have looked it up without finding out that Kurt Russell plays Peter's dad, obviously, and uh, he's um he's the planet Ego from Marvel if you know the comics and that character. But I'm trying to think of what to say without spoiling too much, we see a nicely well developed cycle and fulfillment of his relationship to his father figure between him, Ego, and Yondu. We really see all that filled out. We see him deciding on the type of man that he wants to be. And that's the boy's reaction to the father role, right? The father teaches the boy how to be the man, you know, in this construct, in this in this Freudian idea that we're looking at here. So we really see that happen so nicely. And it it's it's not, of course, the film's not just about the father figure fulfillment. I mean, that's a wonderful story. We also have each of the other characters on the crew developing their emotional depth and developing uh, their, in their character progressions. Rocket specifically, Drax, even Groot, because Groot is, is still our Groot that we knew, but he's going through, he's having to re-go through childhood and, and uh, we see him having to go through all these stages of life again uh, before he'll get to the adult Groot that we know. So, so you know, you even see him develop in that manner. I think I think I should probably stop talking <laughs> because that's that's the thrust of what I want to say. I don't want to give any spoilers away, and I've just seen the movie an hour or two ago, so fresh off the uh, the theater screen there into my mind. I'm sure there's a lot more to delve into, and I want to uh, do a more careful analysis of it eventually. But uh, right now, I just wanted to at least give that out as uh, something to hopefully, if you haven't seen the film yet, take some of this stuff and, and think about it when you're watching the film, or you go back and rewatch the first. You know, think about things that uh, that I might have missed or forgotten to say right now, or whatever. Uh, anything you want to add to the conversation? please let me know below or um, at least talk about it in your own circles and definitely go see the movie it's a great film stay tuned for that uh, three-part wonder woman series which is coming soon and also in the next day or two i'm going to give you some information about my book that's uh releasing this week actually so uh lots of exciting stuff coming with that this is a book on it's called heroic inspirations and it's about the life lessons we can glean from various superheroes and their stories so it's a uh, it's a great piece it goes hand in hand with my channel and uh, yeah, I'll give you information about that. We'll be doing some giveaways, lots of cool stuff. Until then, uh, stay geeky, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.